we are recording on the monday which means sunday we had the rather epic women's world cup cricket fixture between aotearoa and australia in which the white fans lost it was a weird game and i wrote about it this morning because it was i think it was an interesting case of momentum and vibe wildcard and we've actually discussed in our various podcasts a lot of vibey type of things it was kind of me throwing up the vibey things hoping that you'll interpret them in that fashion and i this was a perfect case study in momentum and vibe because by around the 40th over mark i think there was a i was feeling black caps 2015 energy from the basin reserve faithful i was like there's a bit of buzz here there's a bit of hype there's like you know Aotearoa versus australia i think wellington is the women's cricket capital of Aotearoa. i was i think i think christchurch and hagley is the blokes just with a lot of recent you know skewed recently with hagley park getting a lot of test cricket i think that's like the hub of men's cricket wellington on the other hand is the hub of women's cricket now terror and the crowd reflected that big game australia crowds right in behind the kiwis and then ash gardner comes to the crease and she blasts 48 not out of 18 deliveries a strike rate of 266 absolutely smashing fours and sixes i would say ash gardner is probably the most likable australian cricketer as well she's a pretty amazing woman all, all the aussie uh, wahine are pretty chill pretty down to earth pretty cool um pretty cool cats but ash gardner takes the cake she is awesome bowls pretty well but she snatched that um game away from the kiwis and the wellington basin reserve crowd as well came to the crease smashed boundaries all over the park sucked all the energy out of the basin reserve flipped the momentum around and then the white ferns come to the crease and they get rolled and it was a no contest and it was a really important innings because no team has chased down 200 plus runs to win yet like teams have reached over 200 runs in a chase but they haven't won a game chasing over 200 runs in this world cup yet any team and then obviously no team because i kind of had this uh, imaginary 250 run marker it's like oh it's going to be really hard to chase over 250 runs in the world cup and then i looked into it and no teams chased over 200 runs so <laughs> That tells you what you need to know about chasing totals in this World Cup. And don't know why you'd win the toss and field first with that information, which is what the White Fans did. Because if Australia put up over 200 runs, you're not going to chase it down. Like, straight up, let's be honest there. No, no other team is doing it. And Australia have the, are the best team and so on and so forth. So Ash Gardner's knock kind of took the White Fans from chasing... 230 to 40 to chasing 270 and it's a very different equation for the kiwis um and the vibe played into their batting innings uh, sophie divine was dismissed early amelia kerr was dismissed early and it kind of started the rot from then on and it was uh I, yeah it was just an interesting case in a team a player changing momentum which I think is a, we've all seen that in sports. I don't know if I've seen such a drastic suck the life out of an arena type of performance though, where it's, you're not only swinging things in favor of your, in favor to your team, you're also snatching a soul. And the game very quickly went from like, oh, here's the plucky Kiwis coming up against Australia into a rather, uh, into a similar performance against the West Indies, where it was just like the West Indies uh, stole, snatched the White Fern's soul in that game. And I think the Ash Gardner and the Aussies did it as well. How did you just like feel before that Ash Gardner knock and then seeing her go ballistic and then 
or maybe you didn't even tune in then and then you're tuning in for the for the kiwis batting innings and or if you like saw ash gardner going crazy then you go check on some other mahi some other you know whatever else you're doing come back 10 overs into the white ferns innings and you're like oh where did that game go how did you just like process the whole it was basically an hour ash gardner coming to the crease half an hour for an innings break and then you know 10 15 minutes at the start of the white ferns innings and that was the whole game that was like six hours of cricket boiled down into one hour or you know one hour of actual play maybe so how did you just like process everything that happened in a white fans got smoked but it still felt like an epic game of cricket yeah because it wasn't like they were smoked from the very start i mean i i like i, I don't have an issue with them bad um bowling first there because i think it was their best path to victory i think maybe not for the same reasons as they like i think the white ferns just feel like they're a team that are really good at chasing even though they've had a couple opportunities to chase so far this tournament and have lost them <laughs> like um not not ideal like the west indies game was a chase which they couldn't get over the line the australia game a chase where they just didn't even get close um but considering the opponents they were up against i think um they were more likely to do that by like letting Australia bat when they don't know what the pass score is quite yet. Um, and then hoping to just restrict them for something within range of what they can chase. And like for a while there, they were in an all right place. Um, where's the thing here? They had them four for 113 in the 30th over, 29.1. Um, go on when Beth Mooney got out. That's a run rate under four. Um, so every, like on target for less than 200, obviously they're going to go ballistic and, and up that at some point, um, in the, you know, final few overs, but wickets in hand always makes a, a decent, um, hurdle of that. So a couple more wickets in the next five overs. And I think the white ferns were actually in a really good place. Like they'd set things up quite nicely in terms of the platform they built for themselves. Um, and tactically interesting as well like Leah Tahu not opening the not opening the bowling I don't think she even bowled until after the first 10 overs or something like that um which I can see is like a ploy to like not put your fastest bowler out there against their batters who are just going to use the pace and um guide singles and boundaries off of that um try to get a wicket or two of them maybe like you know bit of bit of like run rate um pressure early on get a wicket or two which I actually think like worked um quite nicely and then because you pinpointed the moment when ash gardner comes to the crease i think it might have been actually the partnership before that um which set up what ash gardner did with um elise perry and talia mcgrath wasn't it who came in like mcgrath comes in at four for 113 um perry gets out at uh five for 214 with five overs still to play um 101 run partnership and roughly 15 overs like at a good clip they started off knowing they couldn't really afford to lose another wicket but they steadily increased the they like that they, they didn't just like consolidate they increased the run rate as that partnership went along and then ash gardner comes in and takes it away like i think they'd already done the damage and not the damage but they'd done the work in that partnership to get on top of the game again and then very quickly just asserted that and then from that point on they it was never even close again in the rest of the match like the white ferns lost early wickets knew they needed at least one of their top four the same same formula all the time you knew you need one of those top four to go big you probably need another one of the top four to have like a a decent 50 plus supporting knock and they'll win more games than they don't if that formula works if all four of them get out relatively cheaply i think um Satterthwaite did hang around for a while with the batting mostly with the tail and got what 40 something um but like game long gone by that point i they're not gonna they're just not gonna win many games when they lose early wickets like that for a team whose batting lineup is as top heavy as that and anyway they were already behind the um behind the eight ball because they let australia score too many runs on them in the like in the closing stages of that match and it's just a shame because like i say after about 30 overs it really felt like they're in a position where they they had Australia playing the way they wanted them to play. 
and they were in the kind of contest that they were hoping to get and they just couldn't sustain it. I mean, it's, they won't be the only team who um, has that trouble against Australia. They certainly haven't been for the last several years. Like, Australia are really good. They're very good at asserting themselves on games. Um, they have players who can take momentum back in their favour. It's just, yeah, the, the White Ferns, this is why it was such a, a like interesting, fascinating game. So it was because for a while there, it really did feel like the White Ferns had them where they wanted them. They just couldn't keep them there, right? And it's a good point about the Elise Perry Talia McGrath partnership because that was like a, that just felt like part of a cricketing contest, but it didn't yeah. feel the soul snatching, sucking the life out of the basin reserve. That wasn't going down, even though like McGrath built into her innings like beautifully as you'd like always want to do in ODI cricket. Um, but like, so McGrath got out with Australia on 229. So at that point, it's like, oh, this is still like a, you know, a decent competitive game of cricket. And then Gardner just goes nuts and takes all the life out of the contest, kind of, like halfway through. Um, like I went deep into like different stats, different figures, players in form, players out of form in writing about this. So check that out if you do want that type of breakdown. The one I, idea I am curious, Wildcard, about is how the White Ferns perform in really big games i think the world cup opener against west indies was a big game and it was just a bit weird the the response to that contest was a bit weird um, bangladesh big game for susie bates in dunedin not necessarily a big world cup game and then against india that's a big game I think there's a lot of history, but like they've just played each other in a full series. Um, and the White Ferns were just like fizzing on all cylinders. Everything was honkadori, everything was beautiful there. And then you come into Australia and it's a big game. You're chasing 269. And I was curious to see what Sophie Devine and Amelia Kerr especially did because they're playing in Wellington. You know, big art Tawa for just it's bonkers, you know, record of producing athletes, Sophie Devine and the Kerr sisters in this uh, team. Sophie Louis Devine, Fenton from the Phoenix too. Oh, there you go. But a Fenton action, is he, he's still playing, right? Like, Yeah, he, um, he's probably going to get a start next week because a um, yeah. few of their defenders are, well, a few of their midfielders in here. Some, one of the defenders is probably going to have to play in midfield to cover. So, you know, Fenton, that could be Fenton's opportunity. Anytime I hear Louis Fenton, I'm like, wasn't it like, I just have this thought that he wasn't meant to still be playing top level football because he was like in and out of the Phoenix a few years ago. And then now, like, any time I see him play, he's all good. He's all good for the Phoenix. So I just, yeah. Shout out Louis Fenton, shout out Tawa. So Sophie Devine, Elise Perry's bowling to her. She plays a cracking, like, uh, you know, drive through mid off, pure Sophie Devine power. And then Elise Perry goes a bit wider of the crease, angles it in, swings it away a little bit. And Sophie Devine plays all, all around it, which is like, okay, it's just a weird dismissal. Like, you, Sophie Devine, bat on ball, like, one of the best batters in the world, shouldn't be, like, missing a straight delivery like that. Although there was a game earlier, I can't remember, but maybe it was against India. A spinner came just straight back in and she went back to cut it and she was bowled. So I'm not, I'm like... Not sure about Sophie Devine's form, but my point here, home ground, big run chase, and it was just a bit, it was a weird dismissal. And then Amelia Kerr, she left a delivery off Darcy Brown. Full outswinger. Darcy Brown, real quality bowler herself. And um, Amelia Kerr, great shot to leave. Like, if you're leaving a good delivery, it's a great shot. And then the next delivery... She went to drive it through the covers. It's like, you you just left that. And now you're nicking it. It's a second slip. And it was just, again, a weird dismissal. And those weird dismissals are happening for two Wellington players who Aotearoa needs to perform to chase that tally down. Like, regardless of who else scores lots of runs, like, I don't think Aotearoa wins a a game against Australia in Wellington chasing 270 for victory 
I don't think Aotearoa can do that without a knock from Sophie Devine or Amelia Kerr. And they just got out in really weird ways. And it's nothing necessarily, like you could say, yeah, poor shots or like poor decision-making. To me, it was just weird. And I'm curious about how that weird vibe mixes in with big World Cup games where players need to perform. These are must-win games. And they are must-win games in front of crowds like we're seeing at the Basin Reserve now. Like, crowd numbers are increasing as the, like with nothing to do with the World Cup, but crowd numbers are increasing as the importance of the games increases as well, which is an interesting combination. But yeah, I am curious about how the white fans, because big games coming up, I think they play South Africa on Thursday. At some point, they will have to play against England. England have lost their first two games, but they have a superior net run rate than the White Ferns. So if England get a couple of victories, get back to two or three wins, they're going to be level with all those other teams as well. So they're not far off. And there's a lot of big games coming up. And I'm just curious how these players respond in that way. Um, given the two biggest games so far, they haven't quite like like taken the opportunities to win a big game for their country um, as I think Leah Tahuhu has done with the ball. She has been the bowler who's like, you know, fuck this, I'm going to take wickets and I'm going to dominate and I'm going to lead my team. 